Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Thrall and I'm the General and Personnel Manager with the Lexington Philharmonic. And we are so happy to have everyone here joining us virtually for the second installment of our Connect Virtual Series. Um, this is the second one of our 2021-2022 season. Joining us this evening, our guests are Dr. Everett McCorvey, who is the Professor and Director of the University of Kentucky Opera Theater and the Music Director of the American Spiritual Ensemble. Also joining us, we have Damaris Hill, who is Associate Professor of Creative Writing, English, and African American Studies at the University of Kentucky, and the former Director of the Commonwealth Institute for Black Studies, also at UK. Um, our final guest is Dr. Mark Gaspard Bolin. He is a multi-instrumentalist, jazz scholar, and the arranger for Duke Ellington's Queenie Pie. Um, this evening's conversation is in webinar format on Zoom, so our panelists cannot see your faces, but we are so happy that you're here with us and we want to hear from you. So you can provide feedback or responses in the chat. And if you have any questions for our guests, please submit those in the Q&A section um, at the bottom of your screen. This Connect Talk is hosted by Lexington Philharmonic's Interim Artistic Advisor, Kelly Corcoran. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Kelly. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm so excited to be here with all of you this evening. This season with Lexville, our programming centers on the theme of story, exploring the ways music is a powerful tool for storytelling and how our stories connect us to one another. And at our recent Connect conversation, we spoke with film composers, Carlos Rafael Riviera and Michael Abels. And you may remember that Carlos Rafael R Riviera is the composer for The Queen's Gambit, the Netflix series that's based in Lexington. So talking with him and learning about The Queen's Gambit, that led us to explore the concept of queens, and that led to the development of our Queens Rule program, which we'll be presenting in April of 2022. So we recently announced the details of that program, and we are very excited about a new orchestral suite of music from Duke Ellington's unfinished opera, Queenie Pie, arranged by Mark, who's with us today, um, and we're really excited to hear from him. Our Queen's Rural program also features a robust partnership with the Uni University of Kentucky's Opera Theater. So we're so glad to have Everett with us here too. And then finally, Ellington's Opera includes themes of colorism within the Black community, while also highlighting the power of women. So we're thrilled to also have Damaris with us. So Dr. Hill's writing and research focuses on theories developed by Black women creative scholars and how they intersect with creative writing and 21st century digital tools and technologies. So I encourage you all to read more about the accomplishments and work of our three guests today. And we're really, really grateful to have all three of them here with us. We have a lot to talk about, so we really need to dive in. Um, this is a, a big topic and we could keep going. We're gonna talk about the history and context of Queenie Pie, um, how we made this new arrangement and the partnership in casting, as well as these themes of colorism and feminine power. Um, so Mark, you included in the new full score some wonderful notes about constructing the score and realizing the project. And you talk about Ellington as a prolific composer of like 3000 compositions. And he worked on this opera from the 30s until his death in 1974. So I'm gonna read a little note from the score. And you say that he referred to it as an opera comique, but also a street opera and a folk opera. And you say these particular mixtures of words or labels and the search for how to best describe Queenie Pie suggest that while the work has its power, uh, popular elements, it also has a very serious artistic aim as well. Duke would spend his entire life looking for ways to represent better the new sounds of his fellow African Americans whose music was yet to be considered equally among the more serious music of the European concert tradition. So let's start here. And I wanna hear from all three of you as a way to launch our discussion. And I find it really interesting that Ellington used a mixture of language to describe this work. And we hear the music of Ellington in a lot of different contexts. So has our language today about the work of Ellington changed? How does it fit into this larger canon of 20th century music? 
And in other words, do we still have a hard time trying to define what Queenie Pie is? And do we really need all these labels to define it? I hate labels. <laughs> I don't know how you all feel about all that. Um, but Everett, maybe let's start with you. Like Ellington today, what's Queenie Pie? <laughs> Well, you know, thank you for having me first, and I'm so delighted to be here with all of my colleagues, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, work again with uh, Damaris and Mark. It's great to be able to see you in person, and I'm looking forward to you being here in Lexington. Uh, you know, I think that Ellington was ahead of his time, and uh, his music was just so far uh, above what was going on in so many parts of the country. And I think that it was difficult for people to put him in a box and he didn't want to be put in a box. And so his music is, is just so far reaching that um, at the time that it was written, you know, people didn't know how to label it. And I think that's something that he, he wanted. The thing that really impressed me about Ellington um, from all of my experiences with Ellington is that, you know, the way he used the voice and um, he wanted, he loved classical singers and, but he used the classical singer voice in a jazz style. And uh, I had a wonderful experience when I was freelancing in New York and we were, I was a part of the cast of the Cotton Club, the, the, the film. And I remember working with one of the music directors who had had a experience working with Ellington. And she talked about the fact that he loved classical singers and he wanted, but he wanted to take classical singers in a different direction by using that rich full sound, but then challenging them to do things like jazz. And, uh, and so I really appreciated that and have, and have had wonderful experiences performing his music. So I think what Ellington wanted was for us to not to label his music and uh, let it be, let it stand on its own. Damaris, what would you add to that? I totally agree with you, Everett. I think, um, if we could imagine, maybe for most of us in this audience, that Duke Ellington was, was much like Prince and had a very complex ear for music. And so seemingly desperate genres of music could come together in Duke Ellington's ear, in his mind, and he could have a vision for composition that probably didn't exist for many. I don't wanna say he was the only one for that vision, but didn't exist for many. But I also really enjoyed what Everett said about Duke Ellington seeking out these opera singers. I think Duke Ellington being someone who was so in tune with music and composition, one understood the woman's voice as an instrument, but two, was probably seeking out power vocalist before that became a term, right? And so of course you would go to the women that were singing opera to large houses and knew how to control their breath and their singing and their instrument in that specific way um, to emote light by singing in the head or uh, more timber by singing in the stomach and knew how to use their body as a full instrument and had been thoroughly trained, right? Like an Olympian to use the body as an instrument. And he understood that, right? And so in also understanding that music, he probably understood the limitations associated with a term like opera and with the constraints of classical music. And never mind the fact in order, in order to be a great artist, but particularly to be a jazz artist, you must uh, approach the work as looking for something or some way to be new and evolve every day. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself creates a certain type of bucking and tension against the classical constraints of opera and the, the, the codified genres that existed to reinforce 
European superiority at the time. Yeah. Mark, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and then maybe lead us into, you know, the fact that he worked on it for 40 years. So, and then it was unfinished. What prevented him from finishing this work? All right. Well, um, and thank you as well. I like to, you know, uh, express my uh, deepest thanks for being uh, associated with this project. I just, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, dream come true for me and, and uh, Dr. Hill and Dr. McCorvey. It's nice to be here with you today talking and uh, the rest of the uh, Lexington Philharmonic team. Thanks. Uh, I, I, definitely to dovetail on Dr. Hill and Dr. McCorvey's comments, you know, that um, I think Ellington's, it can be readily heard with Ellington's favorite singers. You know, we have uh, Sarah Vaughn, Lena Horne, Mahalia Jackson. I mean, these are, these are women who's, uh, you know, still held in very high esteem today. Um, and we've really found uh, very few uh, uh, parallels or uh, 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 celebrity who have uh, matched their, uh, their Olympic qualities, right? Um, Ellington once responded to the question, uh, what is jazz? And uh, I quote, music with an African foundation that comes out of an American experience. End quote. And you're you're right, Dr. McCorvey. You know, Ellington totally um, avoided being uh, put in a box as much as he could. Um, and then, you know, also thinking thinking back of uh, you know um, his creativity and and what uh, what gave him um, muse. And he was an artist first. You know, that was really his um, his bag. And so he was obsessed with color. I mean, magenta haze on turquoise cloud, um, black, brown, and beige, uh, you know, um, all through his life. The, the list goes on, on and on. And he painted um, with color in musical terms as well. And so I think there's a, um, there's a parallel there that um, definitely shouldn't be overlooked. Uh, you know, for those of us uh, creatives, uh, everybody on, you know, on this panel, we, Think in, think in terms of where, you know, we we play like kids in a sandbox. And, you know, for uh, for Ellington, um, that sand was uh, colored sand of all, all, all shades and hues. And uh, they had they had a life and, and they had a, a musical sound. And uh, I think that was that's important to note. Now, while Ellington had no problem defining jazz, um, he would struggle to define Queenie Pie, like you like you mentioned. You know, he he called it uh, opera comique, uh, st uh, street opera, uh, even a folk opera. And I think that the limits that were placed on him by what was accepted in society uh, at the time certainly um, acted as constraints for him and what he could and couldn't do. Even somebody of the you know of his uh, uh, of his celebrity. Um, it also suggests that these those particular combinations of words or labels, if you will, um, suggest that, you know, while these, you have these popular themes, that it had a very serious um, artistic uh, aim. And I, Ellington spent his entire life looking for ways to better represent the life, life and sounds of his fellow African Americans. And as we know, and as you, you know, mentioned, um, African Americans have yet to be held equally amongst others um, in that that realm and, and many others in life, and we you know really have to push back um, on that and try to open the open the playing field uh, and open open our minds and hearts to what we consider um, to be as powerful <laughs> as Ellington's music. Um, so, I guess I I view. Queenie Pie is a culmination of Ellington's life's work. You know, to summarize my mentor and Ellington scholar, uh, Dr. James Newton, uh, he would not employ uh, European musical structures, right? Rather, he utilized the blues, call and response, polyrhythm. Um, and he, he, he utilized uh, extended form or long form structures that supported his musical ideas um, and topics. Um, he had single movement works that were quite long um, for the time pushed, you know, where you had to listen it, at first to eat, he'd fill up one side of a, uh, of an LP, um, you know, 33, 30, 33 
uh, uh, long play album. And then eventually you'd have to turn it over to hear the end, you know, and then there'd be multiple discs. Uh, but for those of you that remember, <laughs> remember those discs. Um, and this was, you know, he had pushback from the record companies, but that, you know, because uh, Ellington had uh, the stature that he did, he was able to, uh, to do, he, he was given some, some leeway in that regard. He went improvisation and composition together. Um, like I'd mentioned, he was obsessed with color and, and painting yeah. the town. Um, his, and I think most of all, uh, his themes praised African-Americans and highlighted what was important um, to them and to him and presented the themes that address the human condition. Um, uh, he was devoted to, I uh, quote, capturing and revealing the emotional spirit of his race. And um, in doing so, he, you know, really snatched back the minstrel mask, you know, uh, back from white America, and he controlled the image. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a really beautiful quote uh, from Music is My Mistress, that's the uh, um, Ellington's memoirs. Uh, he says, uh, roaming through the jungle, the jungle of oohs and ahs, searching for a more agreeable noise. I live a life of primitivity with the mind of a child and an unquenchable thirst for sharps and flats. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's great. And I think yeah. those, oh, I'm sorry, Kelly, go ahead. No, I just, I, I don't want to interrupt you. I just wanted to to get Damaris to, to pivot to this concept of colorism. But so, so Damaris, I mean, I'm going to read another quote from Mark's, um, the notes where it says in Queenie Pie, Ellington utilizes multiple themes that thread through much of his work, the Harlem experience, African mythology, love triangle, spirituality, and this celebration of beauty. So help us understand this concept of colorism and um, how it's manifested in literature, music, and art. And then, you know, I know gender and women's studies are central to your work. So how does this concept of feminine beauty intersect with this idea of colorism? Because that's what plays out in Queenie Pie. I'm so sorry. That's, that's where I'm going to start. So for me, for me, I, I have to start with history, right? Like it's easy to say that colorism is a problem in the black community, but most of what is happening in a lot of Ellington's work is a double consciousness that is reflecting both an American heritage and an African-American experience um, being from the diaspora here in America. And so I, I wanna begin with just talking a little bit about Black women's commodified bodies pre-emancipation. So if there was a really strong Black man that could do a lot of work, let's say he was worth about $1,500 commodified in capital during pre-emancipation. A woman, let's say, that looked like me, my height, my weight, um, could reproduce physically um, a form of uh, a form of capital that we know as chattel slavery, right? Like counting the children that I could have in terms of credit to be accessed by people that thought they owned people but also thinking about the amount of production I could do with my hands. So a person like me might be worth like $800. And then there would be children that would be varying $100, two to $300. But then there was a specific commodified body that represented someone of biracial heritage that was often sold for personal use of sexual exploitation or in brothels. That black woman's body was worth $5,000 pre-emancipation. So that level of commodification, right? And that understanding of self-worth and um, production has been fully integrated into all of the psyches in the American culture. Some of us say, oh, um, 
uh, people that resemble more European features are treated better because they look more like Europeans. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but what I do know is true is that everybody in the American system, every physical body is commodified. It has a price associated with it. And along with that commodified value comes a certain set of social norms. And for a commodified body pre-emancipation that was worth $5,000, a culture two generations post-emancipation might still value that aesthetic because it represented a type of social uplift, which is really in broader American culture, what marrying white or European women was all about, access to inheritances and cultural status. And so that was something that was adapted in the black community and represented opportunities if that physical body was available to you that might otherwise not be available to other bodies that were further from that ideal, right? And anybody who wants to know more about this, there were entire laws that were constructed um, to keep white men from marrying black women and having access to black women that they found were beautiful because it destabilizes the property inheritance structure that's in the United States. So all of these things, um, I think, come into play when we start to think about colorism. Now, in terms of art, I think historically, um, art from African American by African Americans or created by African Americans has always been a, aware of colorism, but has also been careful to negotiate the power dynamics with co with colorism, right? Because, um, and this I think is a way to demonstrate an idea that my, um, my friend who's a, a, a queer scholar, um, his name is Dr. L. Lamar Wilson, told me something so profound about sexuality that I think also applies to race. He said, desire knows no gender. When someone is attracted to someone else, it's, it's evident in their body structure. I have found that to also be true about race. When in terms of desire, race, desire knows no race. There have been, I would say, very racist people who also find themselves very attracted to people of the opposite race, right? And so, um, I think the, the, the desires of the body have less allegiance to commodified bodies. And so there we, therefore we need laws and structures to reinforce what's important. So in the United States, a European aesthetic becomes important. 40% of the hair dye that's sold in the United States is blonde. I'm a black girl right now wearing blonde hair. This is when I travel throughout the diaspora, they call this the African-American look, mm -hmm. the diasporic woman. They own, auto, almost automatically know I'm from the United States because of the uh, hair dye that I, and the way I wear hair dye in my hair. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that all uh, plays into colorism, but we can look just as um, Duke Ellington is doing in Queenie Pie and showing these types of negotiations of power in terms of the politics of physical appearance, I think we can see this in a lot of the art that's produced in African-American culture, um, as opposed to what we see happening in Hollywood, right? So Max Factor, uh, I believe, uh, I wanna say, I wanna say, sh no, it's called Lightbox, I believe. But all of these makeup companies that work in Hollywood and that were started in the 1940s, like golden age of Hollywood, they are designed to make the face look lighter. You know, it's interesting you're talking about beauty products and hair because, I mean, this is what Queenie Pie is about, right? And this right. just really relates. And so I just want to give a little context. 
Um, yes. since folks may not really understand this theme, right? That the, the story of Queenie Pie, she's a Harlem beautician. She's voted the best in town for years on end. And then she's challenged by a lighter skinned woman named Cafe Olay, right? So all the things we're talking about. And I think that's interesting that Ellington framed it as a beautician, you know, specifically that I just hadn't made that connection, but all the things you're saying, right? Aligns exactly with what you're talking about. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to pivot here to Everett for a second. Just and I'm, I'm sorry it. I didn't go for it. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I didn't introduce the the larger allegory that's happening in the in the opera. I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. I, I, I we're all good. We are conversing together. So Everett, I mean, casting, right? Like this plays into this and how you cast the singers. And you know, I know like there's all these concepts of color blind casting, color conscious casting. Tell us about these terms, like what they mean, how they've played out in the arts industry, and then specifically what you're doing here for Queenie Pie and aligning with all the things Damaris is saying, right? Because casting is so important when we're thinking about singers to, to, to do this. Well, that's true. And you know, it's, it, uh, I, I could listen to Damaris just all day because I learn every time I'm with you about so many uh, aspects of not only our culture and our history, but you know, one of the challenges, uh, especially in the classical performing arts, is that uh, this access that Damaris was talking about has not been afforded to people of color for a long time. I mean, if you think that, you know, it was just in the 30s before, you know, people like Marian Anderson began to be recognized. And of course, by the time she was recognized at the Metropolitan Opera, it was after, you know, he had had great careers in other uh, parts of the world. And uh, so uh, it was for so long perpetuated, not only on the, th the theatrical stage, but certainly in Hollywood, that uh, characters had to be of a certain color. And so where was the place for actors of color uh, on the, the theatrical uh, set. And so I think that Ellington, again, was ahead of his time because he took these amazing actors and performers and gave them platforms so that they could uh, display their, their gifts. And so as I was thinking of casting uh, this particular uh, opera, I did understand that in order for the opera to tell the story that perhaps Ellington wanted this opera to tell, we had to take in consideration uh, skin colors if we were going to uh, do this. And so the challenge is to find, um, and he put it in the words of the character, her name is Cafe Olay. And so, as we are thinking about that, okay, how can I find uh, an actor, uh, a performer that is of uh, perhaps light skin to match the cafe au lait that he wanted in uh, the opera? And so that was part of the challenge that I had in, in casting this work, finding the right characters for uh, the opera. As we work here at UK Opera Theater, we do work on colorblind casting. And uh, we, have been doing that for years and I'm very proud of the success that we've had in colorblind casting. And one of the reasons I think that we've been able to be successful is because, you know, me as the director of the program, I wanted to make sure that every student, regardless of race or color has the opportunity to perform. And so, there are some theaters that say, okay, well, if I'm going to do a particular uh, show, I have to, you know, we can't mix the races. And uh, I'm sure that many of the, your audience members went to see Carousel when it was on Broadway and Billy Bigelow was a, a, a man of color. And uh, it was a powerful statement that, you know, we have to go past looking at just skin colors and try to cast 
uh, actors and performers based on their talent and, uh, and, and what they're doing in that particular show. But in this particular instance, I did stick to looking for a cafe au lait, a lighter skin uh, performer so that we could have this conversation that we're having about uh, this particular opera. Yeah, and, and so we're not going to get into the full plot of Queenie Pie today, um, but know that these themes are there. There's, you know, love. There's also more existential questions that arise in it as well. But let's hear a little bit from a production that was done from the Chicago Opera Theater a few years back. And then after that, Mark, we'll pivot to you and hear about like the sources that you had available, how you put that together, because you're the one that reconstructed the whole opera when it was first, you know, kind of performed in its entirety. So we'll talk about that a little bit after we watch this video. Yeah, go for it, Mark. Could, uh, could I dovetail real uh, sure. very quickly on uh, Dr. McCorvey's uh, comments about the, you know, casting? Yeah. So we, you know, he, he and I, you know, it, it, we're talking on the phone, try to figure out how to um, how how we were going to, to do this, how to how to put it into the score um, even more uh, explicitly than Ellington had, because he's rather implicit, right, uh, about that uh, about that stuff. So we ended up, uh, you know, utilizing the you know the, that the, uh, the all the characters must be sung by. Um, African diasporic peoples, right? Because we, we don't want to just say African American, because then you have what, ha what happens if there's, you know, um, uh, someone from, you know, Haiti or ha had moved from from France, or you know, that, that weren't African American per se, but perceived as such. So we were we were um, we did we did uh, uh, try to be as uh, inclusive that way as, as possible. And one other thing too, uh, it, Dr. McCorvey, uh, I'm not sure the person's name that you chose for the baritone part, but um, one of the things I think is interesting in, in gender bending uh, in, in this casting for, for Lexington Philharmonic is the, the countertenor, the baritone and the countertenor that we're using. It, um, in the past, I mean, you know, uh, countertenors uh, have had you know, varying um, eras of acceptance and, uh, you know, not being accepted and that, things uh, of that nature. But in this instance, the moon tree, which is sung it, one voice, but sung by three singers is uh, the, the third part is sung by a countertenor, a man. Um, so I think that's a, um, I'm, I'm really excited to, to hear that um, in, in your production. Thanks for that. Yeah, well, that's, you know, great. that's something that's really also really, uh, if you think about uh, performers in the Black experience, performers at Mot in Motown and in, uh, in pop music, that was not unusual to hear a Black singing in a high voice. All we have to do is think of Smokey Robinson or Michael Jackson. I Prince. mean, these were for Prince. These were people who were probably baritones, but sang in that high voice because that was part of the diversity of the race. And so it was something that they could, could do and uh, exploited it. And it was uh, really very exciting. So again, Ellington being ahead of his time, uh, doing this even before it became uh, popular. All right, let's listen to a little bit from the Chicago Opera Theater production.
I'd love to keep listening, <laughs> but you'll get to hear a lot of that in Lexington in April. Um, so Mark, let's, let's tell us about, okay, you had all these little scraps, hotel notes, little bits of stuff, right? And, and you pulled all that together to make the realization that resulted in what we just heard. And then for Lexington, you, you are making an orchestral version. So you added in strings and some other things and it's a suite now. So it's just a condensed little bit of excerpts from the opera. So tell us a little bit about sources that were available and then kind of how you decided what to include in this Lexington version that we're gonna hear in April. Okay, um, well, sources, uh, <laughs> that, that, was, uh, that was difficult. Um, what happened was, um, you know, this idea came about uh, Oakland Opera, um, basically over uh, over drinks, you know, about you know putting together a, a performance. Um, that performance never materialized, but this budding idea of putting together, you know, um, this manuscript um, seemed like a great idea. <laughs> Had we known how much of a challenge it was going to be, you know, um, hindsight's 2020, right? But no, I'm really glad we did it, but it was incredibly difficult. Um, the, there were two major sources. Um, there was a manuscript on the East Coast and one out here on the West Coast. One um, came from the uh, Betty McGettigan collection, who was, uh, uh, she was Duke's partner, um, uh, friend for a long time. And uh, that's at University of uh, California, Irvine, UC Irvine. And that it ended up coming through McDonald McKay, who was uh, the choreographer. Um, so there ends up these, you know, drawing points on a, uh, on a, on a chalkboard would be, uh, uh, would be interesting to see. Then, um, then another one came from the Smithsonian Institute. Um, until that point, the, um, there was no single, each one of them was incomplete. One, each manuscript had something that the other didn't. And it was very interesting. It like, uh, um, like a tablet had been broken apart and, uh, you know, uh, spread out. Um, so between those two manuscripts and then the Smithsonian collection, which was um, incredibly gracious and open uh, to all of us had, um, like you mentioned, just scraps of paper, um, napkins, you know, uh, from from uh, hotel bars uh, across the country, uh, stationery from hotels, um, and uh, you know, so this it, it can the collection contained everything from these these notes, um, and let me see, I guess we, we're uh, we're going a little out of order. You can go ahead and show uh, Sarah. There's a there's a couple examples. You can go ahead and show. Um, so that's, uh, you heard OG, um, and this, it gets complicated with OG because it was, um, utilized first for, um, Lena Horn early on, and then it got, it, it became this, uh, um, a more of a, uh, uh, a blues with a bridge or, uh, um, kind of thing. And that was recorded at the sessions for, um, uh, Drum is a Woman, um, a TV show, in late '60s, and and then ultimately was reworked with lyrics um, that came from uh, something that Ellington's father used to say. OG, you, you know, you make that hat look pretty. OG, um, and so that that's that's interesting. And then if you look at uh, from the Stat, uh, Statler Hilton from uh, Cleveland, here's uh, where he's writing some notes uh, about the, um, the love triangle. He's kind of fleshing this out. It really kind of came about uh, um, from the uh, Frankie and Johnny, um, from that, from that uh, musical and then, and then film. And uh, he, he kind of uh, grifted that and uh, um, that became a, uh, one of the themes uh, to create drama in this uh, opera. The, the next one, uh, Statler again, isn't it? No. Okay, so we have everything from those notes, uh, like the, like that from that we saw from the Statler, to these um, very ambiguous, skeletonized. Um, uh, there's not much notation there, but it gives you an idea um, for for uh, for those of you um, 
that won't see the score, uh, you won't recognize this kind of notation. But I tried to stay true to this type of um, notation in uh, in the score. So uh, um, uh, Kelly and um, Dr. McCorvey we will recognize what this you know this looks like in part of uh, in part of my arrangement, and then then it'll go to something that's a little bit more fleshed out, where you have um, um, you have bass notes. Uh, even though they're whole notes, I think this is really for uh, things like uh, arranger and orchestrator Maurice Perez, who was uh, helping Ellington uh, toward the end of his life uh, to uh, to complete this. And you'll see, uh, you know, I mean, as a pianist, he was just like putting putting down his left hand and playing, uh, you know, where his pinky and then playing a, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, guy tones or some really, you know, a counter a contrapuntal kind of thing um, with his, uh, you know, these these two hand, uh, fingers. And then you'll see a melody. Um, so this is helpful, um, but often we didn't know really where it went unless we matched it, you know, melodic notes and just parts of a melody um, or the lyric that you'll see on the, uh, on the top of it. But lyrics were changing so much that we, uh, we had to try to, you know, like a jigsaw puzzle, figure out which, which things went together. It was really um, quite, quite fabulous. And then um, you'll see something that's just a, a bit more fleshed out, which is great. And again, for those that will see the score, you'll recognize this um, uh, from the arrangement that Lexington Philharmonic will play. And for those of you who won't, you'll hear it. Um, and so this will give you a little sneak peek into that, uh, into the realization. So um, then if you'll show the next one, Full Moon at Midnight, this is, a, um, as you see, a bit more fleshed out. Um, we had less, um, less totally fleshed out things like this. Um, even this would be like a, um, a piano vocal score, right? So you have the, the piano part um, played in the bottom two staves of the, of the group and then the vocal on the top. Um, and so the challenge then uh, as an arranger is to figure out what's where things go. Um, do we have any complete part, so a full melody. Um, if we do have melody or partial um, uh, partial melodies, we construct the melody and then take what we could from scores like this and marry things up and then fill it out orchestrationally this way. Um, so that's uh, it was that was fun. Did I answer everything? Yeah, that's great. I I, I feel like we're teasing a lot of things in this talk. And I feel like it'd be awesome to have an opportunity to talk with all of you more about these things. Cause I'm, I mean, just the process of realizing all of that and going through those and figuring out, you know, what sources and how to integrate them, you know, I'm sure it's just a huge thing. So thank you for sharing that little bit and showing us that. Cause that was really, really great. We have about 10 minutes left. And so I really want to hear from Damaris to talk a little bit about the Commonwealth Institute. And then um, Everett, I want to hear you talk about this part partnership and kind of what it means to the opera department at UK. And then we'll kind of wrap it all and bring it home. So Damaris, let's start with you. I mean, you were the, you are the former director of the Commonwealth Institute at UK. Yeah. And then I, so I want to hear about that and the work of the Commonwealth Institute and what that does. Um, and then of course, you're also a creative writer. And, and, and I was reading a little bit that you were talking about how jazz influences your writing. So just tell us a little bit more about some of those things in your life since Ellington and jazz is this theme and, and part of this community. Yeah, um, so I'll start with the Commonwealth Institute for Black Studies. It's a great space and a collaborative think tank where people from different schools at UK that have an interest in um, African diasporic studies can come together and solve problems in groups rather than working in isolated silos. And we try to stimulate research across campus in the School of Medicine. We wanna work with the School of Fine Arts, School of Humanities, School of Education, um, because we understand that life does not happen in a silo and that a human problem isn't just one problem, right? <laughs> like there are many sources. So we, we, we embrace that. As for me, I am heavily influenced 
not only by jazz and surrealist aesthetics, even before I knew what they were. When I heard Human Nature at like nine, it was like my favorite song, right? I didn't know that it was Quincy Jones' song. I didn't know that it was jazz. I just knew I heard Human Nature and that was different for me. Same thing happened when I heard like Sade's voice. I like froze. I was like, wait, what's that? You know, so the, the surrealist aesthetic was always with me, but I didn't, I didn't have the intellectual framing for jazz. Fortunately enough for me, I, I earned my PhD at the University of Kansas and spent a lot of time in Kansas City learning a lot about jazz and also studying with, with one of my now friends who, uh, Tammy Kernoda, who taught me everything about black women, 20th century vocalist. Um, but when I met her, I, I enrolled in her class because in this very experimental surrealist novel I'm working on, my 12 characters are all assigned to a different jazz singer. I love that. <laughs> it's the way I keep their voices uh, differentiated. Um, and it, and it's also uh, what moves me. I mean, my comfort song is like Funny Valentine. Mm. Like I'm nervous on stage or I'm always anxious, always nervous. But that's what I use to like center myself. It really is like a meditation song. Yeah. And so um, listening to voices like Cassandra Wilson, um, one of my favorite voices Lettuce's voice, you know, to talk about somebody contemporary and um, Tank from Tank and the Bangers, but um, to learn how to control time from Billie Holiday and studying her voice, right? Mm -hmm. And how to, to make time your victim rather than being obliged to time. That's what she does, right? And so there's so much that I learn about the crafts of composition from from vocalist and from understanding that the rules the rules need to be broken purposefully mm -hmm. in composition mm -hmm. to be poignant you know mm -hmm. so i raise all that here because i think it's just inspiring to hear your perspective on how jazz can inspire all of us and can lead to more creativity and to frame that in the context of Ellington and his work. So thank you for sharing that. And I also wanted to make sure we all knew about the Commonwealth Institute because this idea that Black studies is for everybody really resonated with me too, right? That, you know, we all, we all, you know, this is, our, this is history that's relevant for all of us. So I appreciated that as well. So Everett, you're going to kind of bring us home in this conversation to talk about, um, and hopefully we'll all have a, a, a chance at the end to say a final word if, if we'd like, but Everett, this partnership I know is meaningful to you between the Opera Theater and Lexington Philharmonic. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, thank you. One of the things that I uh, work very hard in trying to do with our students is to give them opportunities at the next level. And uh, the day that we're filming this, I am excited to, uh, to say that uh, the opera that just opened at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, Fire Shut Up in My Bones, uh, has six uh, alumni from the University of Kentucky Opera Theater. And uh, last year for their Porgy and Best, we had eight uh, performers from UK Opera Theater. This tells me that we're doing something that's giving our students the opportunity to get to those next levels. So our students aspire to sing with orchestras like the Lexington Philharmonic. Our student musicians in the orchestra here want to play with the Philharmonic. And so it was a natural progression for me um, to really try to make this happen, uh, this collaboration. And I really appreciate the Philharmonic, um, Kelly, your work and Sarah's work and the board of the Philharmonic really looking uh, at the opera program and saying, hey, how can we give these young performers an opportunity uh, with a professional orchestra so that they can not only put that on their resume, but 
get the experience of what it is like to work with a professional orchestra. And uh, because this is what they're gonna need at the next level. And so we're very excited about that and very appreciative to the Philharmonic. And we're really looking forward to, you know, not just this one opportunity, but hopefully many opportunities in the future as we move forward. Uh, so that our young performers who come from all parts of the United States and from many parts of the world uh, come to UK to work on developing their craft uh, in opera. So, so we're very excited about this opportunity. Well, we're really excited too. Um, okay, we have a few minutes le left and I know we started a little late. So I wanna give each of you an opportunity to just add any final thoughts or words. Um, Mark, let's start with you. I mean, message of Queenie Pie, you know, what do you think? Any final thoughts you wanna leave with us? Well, uh, first I'd like to uh, uh, dovetail on Dr. McCorvey's uh, comments, you know, uh, the fire shut up my bones. Um, that is, you know, written by, you know, jazz musician Terrence Blanchard. And it is, in fact, the first um, for a Met to have, a, to open with a, an opera by a Black composer. Actually, not just open, but to, you know, I mean, that's it, to, to host an opera by a Black composer. So I think that's really, in a, for a company, uh, you know, 138 year history, you know, it's about time, let me say. Um, so I think that's, a, you know, um, definitely worth noting. And even though Ellington's works um, and, and uh, you know, we're, since, we're, since we're speaking about Ellington in particular right now, um, aren't programmed as much as say, you know, Mazarski's uh, Picture and Fiction or uh, Firebird Suite or La Mer. Um, you know, uh, people of color, you know, artists of color are gaining a larger share of the orchestral and operatic programming space, which um, I applaud. Uh, I think it's really, you know, um, really uh, wonderful to note uh, here at the, in the discussion here. Um, we didn't get to talk about the realization much, but just very quickly, um, you know, we, I had to cut about two hours worth of, of music and that was incredibly painful. Um, <laughs> you know, I just, uh, it, it hurt so much, but that being said, I'm, I'm really excited to hear, um, you know, we, we have, uh, uh, speaking with, uh, with, with, with you all, the, Le uh, the Lexville team, um, we decided really to keep the narrative moving, uh, you know, and to, to try to have things represented, um, that maintain the narrative arc so that if you haven't seen the opera, which most people in the audience will, have, uh, you know, probably not have seen it. Um, they would get a, a general sense uh, for an understanding of the opera. Uh, so that's kind of how I went about it. It's just picking those, um, those pieces that, um, that would support the narrative, but then that I also thought would present well with, in an orchestral format. Almost uh, like the Cliff Notes version, maybe. I don't know if that's a good analogy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks, Mark, so much um, for all of those thoughts and for sharing that all with us. Damaris, did you have any final thoughts to share? Thank you for being here to all three of you, of course. Oh, thank you so much. I didn't get to say thank you so much for the invitation. This is like loads of fun. I keep forgetting to say thank you because I'm so greedy to be in this conversation. But um, something that I wanted to add is that I think all three of us keep talking about the, the innovations that we were witnessing through um, Ellington's work prior to when they became popular. Maybe we need to start framing it as if Ellington invented these things like the power vocalist or yeah. like this uh, eclectic blend. And let's, let's start thinking about Ellington being an originator before it became popular. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the other thing I wanted to say about the 40 years of Duke Ellington working on this opera, I think at one time in African-American culture, African-Americans thought that, um, that simply through art and expression and demonstration and affirmation that African-Americans could convert and rid the United States of, of its leanings towards racism. 
a lot of African-Americans no longer have that optimism. But Duke Ellington might have still embraced that optimism and may have been looking for the precise pitch to talk about colorism and its effects on the African-American community in a way to transform popular culture's thinking about it. Um, and I think that also should be applauded when we talk about some of the aims of the work. I love that too, that reframing of some of those ideas. Everett, you get the final word. <laughs> well, I just want to say that uh, what has been coming through this whole uh, conversation is that Ellington was a genius. And uh, he was also a working musician. And so, Mark, I'm looking at all of those different pieces of paper and things like that. Those were things he wrote down between gigs, on the way to gigs, at dinner, while he was waiting for the time of the gig to happen. He was a working musician and he was a genius. And so I hope that we continue to celebrate his music and in all of its forms, uh, because it is it is monumental and it is work that should never be forgotten. I want to thank you all for being here, and I hope we have an opportunity to have more conversations because obviously there's a lot more we could keep talking about. <laughs> um, but thank you for your time. Thank you for your partnership, and I know we're all so excited to hear. Um, this this concert when we come to April. So thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you.